Where do we begin to describe a man whom the Prophet said that if there was a Prophet to come after me, it would be Umar? Where do we begin to talk about a man whom the Prophet said, Ya Umar, when shaitan sees you walking down a road, he takes another road. And in another narration, the Prophet said, when shaitan sees you, he turns around and runs. In Umar al Khattab was the man who, who when, when there was rumor of a lady who was, who was speaking to someone behind her husband's back, he just turned around to look at her, she lost her baby. Umar was the man who, who when all of the Muslims, even the Prophet and Abu Bakr were migrating to Medina in secret, in hiding, Amr was the one who, when he wanted to migrate, he got up. He walked into the middle, the middle of the city, the Kaaba, where the marketplace and all the people are standing. And he told them, I've accepted this land and I'm migrating to Medina. Anyone who wants to make his mother cry and his wife a widow and his son, his children, orphans, follow me behind the mountain. Every single child which was born in the Muslim world would get an allowance. 1400 years ago, Umar anhu with uh, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, one day they were looking after a group of people. Amazing. So there's a child which is crying. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu, he goes up to this woman and he says to this woman, make your child quiet. Later on at night time, the child is still crying. So he comes back to the woman and he said, what an evil mother you are. All night your child has been crying. She doesn't know that this is Umar ibn Khattab anhu. So she says, Amir al-Mu'mineen has stipulated allowance for every child which has been weaned off, which is no longer drinking mother's milk. I need that allowance. That's why I'm trying to wean my child off and that's why he's crying. Abdurrahman ibn Awf anhu narrates, when Umar led the Fajr Salah that morning, he says, I swear by Allah, he cried so much that we couldn't understand what he was reciting. And then Umar turned around after Salah and he said, Woe unto you, Umar. How many children have you killed because of this law of yours? Then from that day, Umar made it for that every child when it's born, it has allowance. It's where we were and where we've come to. One day, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu decided to walk through the gullies of Medina Munawwara at night. And he was followed by Talha radiallahu anhu. And he walked into one home quietly when no one was watching. And he came out after a little while and he went back. So Talha radiallahu anhu decided to go the following day to that house to see who there was and what happened. And he found there was a very old blind woman there. So he asked her, who came to you last night and why did he come here? She said, I don't know, but it's a man who told me that he will come every so often he brings me some foodstuffs and he cleans my whole house in a little while and then he goes back. Talha radiallahu anhu says, Subhanallah, this is Amirul Mu'mineen. This is the leader of the Mu'mineen. And he goes himself at night to clean the house of this blind woman and to bring her some food once in a while. This was Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu. And you know, when Umar radiallahu anhu, when they conquered Bayt al Maqdis, brothers, Jerusalem, the head of Christendom the city of the Anbiya. When he received the keys to Bayt al-Maqdis, a great honor bestowed upon the Muslims. He called for his companion, Abu Abidah ibn al-Jarra. He says, all of this is because we kept away from sin. And Allah is going to ask us, what have we done to serve this deen after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how little we have done. And him and Abu Ubaidah, they went behind the tree and they both started to weep. How little we have done. They conquered Jerusalem, brothers, subhanAllah. In 10 years, the Roman and Persian Empire had been defeated. The two superpowers of the day. Umar, the son of Al-Khattab. Al-Khattab, his father, was a very harsh, rough man. And he used to treat Umar very roughly, very harshly. And he used to make Umar work as a shepherd. So he would spend his days minding the camels and the goats of his father, Al-Khattab. But Umar radiallahu anhu was a very intelligent man. He was one of the few Arabs who knew how to read and write. 
They were illiterate people. Even the Prophet ﷺ, he was not literate. But Umar was one of the few who was able to read. And he was well versed in poetry. And he was a noble and dignified amongst Quraysh. And for this reason they chose him to be their ambassador in the time before Islam. Quraysh would send Umar ibn Khattab to be their delegate, their ambassador, to meet with the other tribes, to meet with other nations, to represent Quraysh. He was also a wrestler. He used to wrestle in the festivals because Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was a large man, a big man. He was tall and muscular and strong. He was so tall and so big, it looked as if he was riding when everyone else was walking. He says he engaged in all the vices. He was a person who worshipped idols that he carved with his own hands. And he was a person who was involved not only with alcohol, but even with women. And then as he grew up, he was well respected in Quraysh because he was a businessman and he earned a lot of his wealth. So at a young age, not only was he wealthy and eloquent, but at the same time, he was quite feared because of his power and might in Quraysh. When Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam presented Islam to the people of Mecca, Umar ibn al-Khattab was one of those youth who used to constantly listen to the older people saying, we need to eradicate this man. We need to get rid of this man. This is what they used to say. So the young people used to all talk to each other. Who is going to do this? And each one would say, I will do it. This one would say, I would do it. But no one would actually end up doing it because they were upset that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was telling them that what your forefathers have been doing is wrong. And what I have come with is actually correct. Don't worship me, but worship my maker and yours who is Allah. So they could not understand what is the catch. Normally Quraysh, anyone who tried to say someone else was bad, it was because they had their own agenda. And in this particular case, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had no agenda of his own. Rather, he would call people to develop a link with their maker alone. And this was something unique. And the Quraysh and the Quraysh leaders were asking, you know, people to find him and I'll give them so many thousand dirhams and whoever can find and get rid of this evil for us and so on. And in one narration, Abu Khattab said, are you, are you serious? You're going to give 1,000 dirhams for the one who kills Muhammad? Really? And they said, yeah, wallahi, that's the absolute truth. There's so many different narrations about how he actually sets off on this journey. And in this narration of Bayhaqi, he was going and he came across a companion by the name of Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, who had just become Muslim recently. And he said, Ya Umar, where are you going? I am going to get rid of Muhammad, the one that divided the people of Quraysh, the one that's been speaking against the laws of the people of Quraysh. So Nu'aym ibn Abdullah wanted to divert Umar ibn al-Khattab so he could have the extra time to warn the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the planning and the plotting of Umar ibn al-Khattab. So Nu'aym will say to Umar, O oh Umar, why would you want to go and kill Muhammad if your own sister Fatima bint al-Khattab and your own brother-in-law Saeed ibn Zayd had already became Muslims? Why didn't you start with your own family? And that was the biggest shock in the life of Umar ibn al-Khattab to know that his own sister Fatima and his own brother-in-law Saeed became Muslims when he did not even know anything about that. At that very moment, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sent Khabbab ibn al-Arat teaching them the new revelation of Surah Taha. While Umar ibn al-Khattab will arrive to the house of his brother-in-law and his sister, he will hear some whispering of the Quran al -Kareem. And then he starts to bang and knock the door. They will ask, who is it? So he says, it's me, Umar. And that moment, everyone in the household became petrified and scared, including Khabbab ibn al-Arat, in which he went and hid in one of the rooms. And Umar ibn Khattab will budge into the house and will see his sister and slap her severely that she goes on the ground. And then he starts to hit and strike his own brother-in-law. And his sister's trying to stop him until that moment Umar ibn Khattab gazed and looked at his sister and he saw her bleeding. So he became sympathetic and he regretted what he done towards his sister and his brother-in-law. So he stopped and then he sat down and there was a piece of paper that had verses of the Quran written on it. He came to touch it. So his sister told him, no, 
you are impure. She said to him, you need to make ghusl. So he went and had a shower. He came out of his way just to read those words. And then he grabbed that piece of paper in which said, Taha, we did not reveal the Quranic in him upon you to become a burden. It is a revelation from the one that created the earth and the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ar-Rahman, the most gracious, made istiwa on the arsh to Allah azza wa jal belongs what's in the heavens and what's on earth and what's in between them and what's beneath the ground. When he read those verses, he was astonished. And then he said, what kind of words are these? Someone that says words like these must be worshipped alone. Where is Muhammad? Why? I want to become a Muslim. Taqabab ibn Arat will come out out of his hiding and he'll see Umar ibn al-Khattab and he'll say to him, by Allah, the messenger of Allah made dua to Allah a few days ago. Oh Allah, honor Islam. One of the two, Umar, Umar ibn al-Khattab or Amr ibn Hisham. And Allah Azza wa Jal loves you, O oh Umar. That's why Allah accepted the dua of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Take me to the messenger of Allah. I want to meet Muhammad. I want to embrace Islam. He then went to the, the house near Safa where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was staying with his companions. And there's Abu Bakr there and Hamza was there and so on and a few other people. As he was walking, he was twirling his sword, you know, like, like he does, you know, big man, strong man. And he was walking very confidently and so on. And they saw him coming in the door. They were shocked and scared. And, oh my goodness, it's Umar bin Khattab coming. What we're going to do, what we're going to do. And here he's coming, walking down and, uh, and he comes up to the door and knocks on the door and so on. And then Hamza says a very famous statement. He says, uh, let him in. If he's come for, for khayran, then we will be then uh, the best that one can possibly be with the guest. But if he comes for sharran, if he comes for any evil or any fitna or wants to mess around, they will kill him with his own sword. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells the Sahaba, let Umar ibn al-Khattab in. And when Umar ibn al-Khattab enters the house, the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam will grab him from his shirt and the Nabi alayhi salatu wa salam will pull him and he'll say to him, oh the son of Khattab, isn't it time for you to know that there is no God except Allah and I am the messenger of Allah. At that moment, Umar ibn al-Khattab he said, oh messenger of Allah, I came for that reason. I testify that there is no God except Allah and I testify that Muhammad is the Prophet and the messenger of Allah. Allahu Akbar! Allah Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! It was an amazing takbir that was heard all the way to the Kaaba. So many people heard it in Mecca. The first thing that happened. He says, O Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are we not on the right path? Yes, we are. Well, what are we fearing for? Let us get up and go and pray at the Kaaba. Why must we do it in the house of Al Arqam here? So he got up. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got up and they made two lines of people. Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib was the leader of one and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was the leader of the other. 20 people on either side and they marched all the way to the Kaaba. And that was the first day that they congregated and they prayed right at the Kaaba and the people of Quraysh were gobsmacked. They did not know what to say. No words to utter. Why? Because Umar is with them. What should we do now? They're just watching. Strong man whom we had hoped that he would deal with the crisis became a part of the crisis, according to Quraysh. Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu an, he says, when Omar accepted Islam radiallahu an, that is when we became powerful. We could sit in groups in public. We could tell people we were Muslim and no one dare lift a finger upon us. This was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. He was the one who, when he entered Islam, no one dared persecute him. Umar radiallahu anhu, when he saw this happening to the Muslims and no one dared challenge Umar, what did he do? He wanted, didn't want to miss out on the reward. So he went and literally knocked on the door of the leaders of Mecca so that they could per persecute him. He would knock on the door and tell them, I accepted the religion of Allah, the religion of the Prophet وسلم, And they would close the door in his face. No one would dare challenge him. Who's going to hit Umar? Then he'd go to the second door. Again, even to Abu, Abu Jahl's door. He knocked on the door. Abu Jahl as well slammed the door in his face. And he kept doing this until a whole group gathered around him. And when this entire group gathered, gathered around Umar, then they had the guts to hit him. When it was his time to go for Hijrah to Medina Munawwara, he did not do what the others were doing. They were all quietly going. By night, they would go away because 
Quraysh and their relatives were persecuting them. So Umar ibn al-Khattab heard all this and he knew he had a big family and he knew Quraysh was large. He went to the Kaaba. He made his tawaf around the Kaaba and then he went on to the maqam and he called out very loudly. He says, Oh Quraysh, I am going out for Hijrah. I am leaving to Medina Munawwara. Anyone who wants their mother not to see them again, anyone who wants their children to be orphaned, and anyone who wants their wives to become widows, see me on the other side. Try and mess with Umar ibn al-Khattab. Come see what happens. Nobody followed him. This was the same Umar ibn al-Khattab anhu, who went into the house of the Prophet wasallam, and he looked around and there was hardly any worldly goods. A few water pouches, a pillow, and the Prophet ﷺ was lying on a straw mat. And he began to cry. And the Prophet, and the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh, Umar, why are you crying for? He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, look at the pomp and the glory which the Romans and the Persian leaders live in. And you are the greatest of creation. Look at the simplicity which you live. And the Prophet ﷺ was lying down and he sat up and the imprint of the mat was on his side. That's how rough it was. And the message of Allah said, Oh, Ibn al-Khattab, even you, Ibn al-Khattab, even you, have you not understood that my example is like a traveler who takes shade under a tree? For a while he takes the shade and then he moves on. He said, Umar, have you not understood? Umar understood. You know what house they say this house was? The narration mentioned this house where Umar radiallahu anhu went was the house of Aisha radiallahu anhu. No house was more Mubarak than this house. There was no fancy carpet. The ceiling barely exceeded your heads. But there was Barakah in this home. Once, Umar al-Khattab came to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu was with some of his wives. And they were speaking to him. And they were raising their voice above his voice. So Umar knocked on the door and asked for permission. So when they heard his voice, immediately they ran and put their hijab on and then started to hide themselves. So the Prophet ﷺ gave Umar permission to enter. So when Umar came, the Prophet ﷺ was smiling. So Umar ibn Khattab, he said, May Allah always keep you smiling, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said that I was laughing smiling because I'm as amazed at these women that before they were raising their voice but as soon as they heard your voice they ran and hid themselves so Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu he said no you are more worthy of being feared you are the messenger of Allah they should have more fear of you more respect for you and then he addressed these women oh you women who are enemies of your own souls do you fear me more than the messenger of Allah so they said, yes, you are more harsh and more rough and more strict than the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, let them go, ya Ibn Khattab. Don't blame them any further. By him in whose hand is my soul, wallahi, I swear by Allah, shaitan never sees you walking a path except that he takes another path other than your path. So why wouldn't these women be afraid? when shaitan himself is intimidated by you. Umar radiallahu was the man who when he was so pure, al faruq the criterion between right and wrong, he was so pure that when he would speak, Allah would reveal it in the Quran. Several occasions when the, when the wives of the Prophet played that trick on the Prophet and then, then Umar radiallahu couldn't believe what they did to him. So he went to the wives of the Prophet and he spoke to them. And he told them basically, if you don't fix yourselves up, Allah will replace you with someone better for the Prophet ﷺ. Aisha couldn't accept this. She goes, do you have to speak on behalf of the Prophet? A, a little while later, Allah has revealed in the Quran those exact words. That if you don't basically fix yourself up, it, it, Allah will literally replace you with better for the Prophet ﷺ. In another occasion, when Umar came to the Prophet ﷺ and told him, Ya Rasulullah, shouldn't we make Maqam Ibrahim? Shouldn't we make that a place of prayer? A little while later, Allah Azawajal revealed in the Quran and take from the place of Ibrahim a place of prayer. And subhanAllah, this is how, how pure this man was. During the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when Abu Bakr was the Khalifa, Umar continued to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Once, two men, al aqra bin Habis and Ayyan ibn Hassan, two leaders from two different tribes, they came to, to Abu Bakr 
and they said there is some land, some public land that is deserted. It is desert. Nothing grows on it. So assign it to us so that we can plant on it and try to make it beneficial so perhaps people can benefit from it. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he asked the Sahaba around them, what do you think? The Sahaba around Abu Bakr, they said, yes, we see no harm in that. Give it to them. So Abu Bakr wrote a contract, a, a decree, allowing these men to take possession. And then as a witness, he put Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar was not present. Go and get his signature. And they found Umar, he was putting tar on his camel. And they said, we have a document here that we need you to witness. So should we read it to you or will you read it yourself? So Umar said, well, you see what I'm doing. You see I'm busy. So either you read it to me or you wait until I'm finished and then I will take it and read it. They said, fine, we'll read it to you. So they read the document to Umar. And after they finished, Umar said, give me the document. So he took it and he spit on it. And he started rubbing out the writing. So they started screaming at him, what are you doing? So Umar, he said, the Prophet وسلم, used to give you, he used to give you from the ghanima and give you from the zakah when Islam was weak. Because the Prophet وسلم, in his wisdom, those people who were new to Islam, sometimes he would give them more from the ghanima in order for their hearts to draw close to Islam. And those who were older Muslims who had been Muslims for a long time, he would give them less. Because they know now that their deeds are for Jannah, not for this dunya. So they didn't need the money. So Umar said, the Prophet used to give you when Islam was weak. But now is Allah has honored Islam. So we have no need to give you these free things anymore. So go and do whatever you like. So they went away back to Abu Bakr. And they were angry. And they started complaining about what happened. And then they said, we don't know who is the Khalifa. Is it you or is it Umar? So Abu Bakr, he said, he is the Khalifa if he wants to be. And then Umar came. He was angry. And he went straight to Abu Bakr. And he said, tell me about this land that you give these two men. Is this your land or is this land that belongs to all the Muslims? Abu Bakr said, no, it's land that belongs to all the Muslims. Then why did you give it to these two men? Abu Bakr said, I made shura with the Muslims around me. But did you make shura with all the Muslims? This land is the property of all the Muslims. Did you check with all of them? So Abu Bakr, he said, Ya Umar, I already told you that you have more strength within the, for this position than I do. You are stronger and more capable for this responsibility of Khilafah than I am. But you forced me to be Khalifa. You forced me to be the Khalifa. One of the first things Umar ibn Khattab did when he became Khalifa is he fired Khalid bin Walid. And he told the people, I don't fire Khalid because he has done something wrong or because I'm displeased with him. But the people have been tested by Khalid. The people are forgetting that victory comes from Allah and they are thinking that victory comes only from Khalid. Because Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu was becoming now a legend. Never in history did Khalid bin Walid lose a battle. And so the people were now being convinced that victory was coming from Khalid. So Umar wanted to destroy this idea and make it clear. Victory doesn't come from Khalid. Victory doesn't come from Umar. Victory doesn't come from anyone. It only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, there were two men who brought in a young boy dragging into the courthouse. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he asked him, what is this? What is going on? Why are you dragging him into the courthouse? They say this boy, he killed our father. Umar ibn Khattab, he asks him, did you really kill their father? The boy says, yes, I did kill their father, but it was by accident. My camel, it used to tread on their property. So one day their father took a rock and hit the camel in the eye. And I saw the camel suffering and it made me infurious and aggravated. So I took a rock and I threw it at the father. It hit him in the head and he died. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu, he asks the, the two brothers, will you forgive this young boy for this accident? They say, no, we want kisas, we want retribution. So Umar ibn Khattab anhu, he asks the young boy, do you have any last words, any last wishes, any last requests? And the young boy says, yes, my father passed away and I have a younger brother. And my father left some money behind for my younger brother. 
I would like three days to go and retrieve this wealth in the, from a hidden place so that I can make sure my brother gets it when I die and pass away. So Umar ibn Khattab, he thinks this boy is making up the story. He's like, boy, what are you talking about? What wealth? What father? What young brother? The young boy, he says, trust me. Umar ibn Khattab, he says, okay, I will trust you, but find a guarantor for you. Someone who will guarantee that you will come back. The young boy, he looks around, there's a packed courthouse. Will someone not help me today? And everyone, as the boys looking around, they turn their face away, they turn their faces down. No one wants to help this boy. Then from the back of the courthouse, a hand raises up. Whose hand is it? Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anh. The noble and illustrious companion who gave da'wah to so many of the tribes. He says, I will be the guarantor of this boy. Meaning that if this boy does not come back, it is the head of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he says, I will be the guarantor. So the boy goes away. The first day goes by, the boy is nowhere to be seen. The second day goes by, the boy is still nowhere to be seen. Asr time comes on the third day. The two brothers go to Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. And they say, come with us to the courthouse. It is time. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu says, I will come to the courthouse, but the day does not end until Maghrib. So now Abu Dhar al-Ghifari is walking through Medina with these two brothers. They're going to the courthouse. And the people of Medina are following behind them. All getting to the courthouse to see what is going to happen. It is now the talk of the town. You can imagine, minutes are going by. The courthouse is filling up. The anxiety is building up. And literally minutes before the Adhan of Salat al-Maghrib, the boy rushes in. People are now shouting, they're you know, happy, they're wondering what's going to happen, you know, will everyone be forgiven, will everyone be happy, what's going to happen? So the boy comes in, the Adhan from Maghrib hasn't gone. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he asks the boy, Oh boy, why did you come back? I did not send a spy behind you, I did not send anyone to follow you. What made you come back? He said that I did not want anyone to say that a Muslim gave his word and did not fulfill it. So I came back. Umar ibn Khattab, he turns to Abu Dhar and he says, Oh Abu Dhar, what made you want to be the guarantor of this boy? He says, I saw a Muslim in need and he did not want anyone to ever say that a Muslim was in need and no one was there to help him. So I raised my hand to be his guarantor. The two brothers, they say, when we have people like this, how can a Muslim ask for forgiveness and no one be there to forgive him? So they forgave the boy and the boy was forgiven. This was the legacy of Islam. This was the code of conduct. This is why during the Khilaf of Umar ibn Khattab, they were able to reach the border of China all the way to the south of France. Once he went to Ubay ibn Ka'ab and he was upset and he entered Ubay's house and he said, tell me about this verse that those who harm the believers, the male believers and the female believers, what is the meaning of this verse? Because I am afraid that this verse applies to me. I am the one who harms the believers. I hit them. I am the one harming them. So this verse, does it apply to me? So Ubay ibn Ka'ab said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. You are the shepherd and you can do nothing but take care of your flock. Sometimes the shepherd must be stern with his flock. He must hit the sheep to make sure the sheep goes in the right direction. You cannot but command and forbid your flock what is right and what is wrong. There is no way except for you to do this. So Umar said, that's what you say. But Allah knows best. Once Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he saw Umar al-Khattab enter into a garden and he was alone, secluded. And has crept close and was listening. And Umar was talking to himself. Well done, well done, Ya Ibn al-Khattab. He was being sarcastic. By Allah, you will fear Allah or Allah will punish you. He was admonishing his own soul. Fear Allah or Allah will punish you. Once, Umar called the people to assemble in the masjid. And then he stood up on the minbar. And he praised Allah. And then he said, when I was a young man, I used to take care of the camels of my father and my aunts. 
and they would pay me at the end of the day just a handful of raisins or dates as my payment. I would work all day and my salary would just be a handful of dates. And then he climbed down. So Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, what are you doing? You called the people and then you went up and you didn't say anything important. You just degraded yourself. You just made people look down upon you. You brought your stature down. So Umar said, that was what I wanted to do. Because my soul was telling me that before you were a shepherd and now you are Amir al-Mu'mineen. You are the leader of the believers. And my soul was telling me that there is no one between you and Allah. You have the highest position now in the dunya. There is no one between you and Allah. So I wanted to teach my soul who it really is. I wanted to remind my soul who you are and where you came from. His armies were attacking the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And one of the cities that was opened up in Persia was Tustur. And the Sahaba, when they went there, they found the grave of the Prophet Daniel. And they found the body of Daniel, Prophet Daniel. And they said that it looked as if he had died yesterday. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that as an honor to the Prophets, Allah prevents the bodies of the Anbiya from being decomposed, from decaying. So they wrote a letter to Umar al-Khattab saying, what should we do? How do we deal with him? Where do we bury him? So Umar al-Khattab wrote a letter back saying, dig 13 graves all around the city during the day. When no one is awake and no one can see you, go and bury that body in one of the graves and cover all the holes up. Cover them all up so that in the morning the people wake up and they don't know which grave is the grave of Daniel. To make sure that no one is able to go and do shirk at the grave of this prophet. So Umar goes to Jabiya. When he reaches Jabiya, he says to Abu Baidah, he said, Abu Baidah, take me to your house. I want to see your house. So Abu Baidah radiallahu anhu says, Oh, Mirul Mu'mini, why do you want to go to my house? When you go to my house, the only thing which will happen is that you will rinse your eyes, meaning you will cry. Umar says, No, let me go to your house. He goes to the house of Abu Baidah and it's a little mud hut. A little mud hut. Umar enters and he looks around and he says to Abu Baidah, do you have anything to eat? And Abu Baidah radiallahu anhu brings some crumbs and some water. And Umar looks at the crumbs and the water and he says, Abu Baidah, nothing else besides this? And Abu Baidah radiallahu anhu says, Umar al-Mu'minin, it's enough to get me on to the other side. It's enough to get me to the other side. And Umar begins to cry and he said, Abu Baidah, I swear by Allah, the dunya has changed all of us beside you. Umar came from Medina to Jabiya with 17 patches. Most powerful man on the face of this earth. The Sahaba said, oh, Mir al-Mu'minin, you come all the way to Medina, to Jerusalem. These people are going to give you the key. But when they steal your state, change your Mir al-Mu'minin. Just for a little while, just change. And some narration, some narration mentioned that Umar radiallahu anhu actually went into the tent and he changed his clothes. So he wears his new clothes. And Umar radiallahu then comes out. He takes a few steps and he turns to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. He said, do you remember when we were a base nation and Allah honored us through Islam? So where will we be if we leave the teachings of Islam? He went back into the tent. He took off these new clothes and he wore his clothes with 17 patches. History has forgot those kings who lived in their palaces. And history remembers Umar ibn Khattab. He leaves to meet the patriarch. So on his way, he's with his khadim. They have one uh, camel and then they have one lesser animal. And they were taking turns. So when they reach the outskirts of Jerusalem, now there's thousands of people waiting to meet Amir al-Mu'min. And it's the, it's the khadim's turn to ride the camel. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, you ride the camel. He said, no, Mir al-Mu'min, it's this thousands of people waiting to see you. You're the most powerful man on the face of the earth. You ride. Umar said, no. Honor is for those who fulfill their promises. Umar walked into Jerusalem on the donkey. But Umar remained Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Khadim remained the Khadim. He reaches, which is today is still known as the Babi Umar, the gate of Umar, the patriarch is waiting there. They, 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 they draw a pact. Once they've finished this deal, 
the patriarch gives the key to Umar radiallahu anhu, he begins to cry. Umar radiallahu anhu said, what are you crying for? He said, I'm crying because as long as the Muslims have a man like you, they will never be defeated. Umar goes into Masjid al-Aqsa. He begins to clean Masjid al-Aqsa. After cleaning it, he prayed two rakats. Allah Akbar. Fulfilled the sunnah. All the sahaba radiallahu anhum there. It's salat. So they look around for the adhan and they say Bilal. And Umar radiallahu anhu goes to Bilal. He says, oh, Bilal, give the adhan. So Bilal says, no. I stopped giving the adhan after the demise of the Prophet Umar insisted until finally Bilal stands up. Bilal in Masjid al-Aqsa. Umar there. Khalid bin Walid there. Sharahbil and all the other Sahaba there. And he starts to give the adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. The narration mentioned those beards when they embraced Islam which were black and now had turned grey out of old age. Every single one of them was drenched with tears because it brought back for them the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar leading Salah, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, Wa'ad ibn Jabal, and all the other Sahaba radiallahu anhum behind. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a Salah better than this? I will tell you about a Salah which is better than this. Subhanallah, asra bi abdi laylan min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. When Allah took His beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Masjid al Aqsa. In that day, the first saf wasn't Bilal, Shirahbil, or Mu'adh, or Khalid, or Abu Baida. The first saf was Ibrahim, alayhi salatu salam, Yusuf, alayhi salatu salam, Yunus, Idris, and the 124,000 Anbiya. And the leader of the salah was the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Umar radiallahu anhu finished his salah. He turns around to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu and the others who were sitting there, and he begins to cry. La ilaha illallah. So they said, O Mirul Mu'mineen, what are you crying for? The conquest, Masjid al-Aqsa on your hands, you fulfill the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah. It's a day to be happy. Why are you crying for, O Mirul Mu'mineen? He said, I know. But I remember the words of the Prophet ﷺ, when the Messenger of Allah wasallam said that it is not poverty I fear for you. And in some narration, it is not shirk that I fear for you. But it's that that Allah unfolds the dunya in front of you. And you compete in it like those who competed before you. And the dunya destroys you like it destroyed those before me. The patriarch took Umar radiallahu anhu. He said, come and see the place where Jesus is buried. Because they believe that the Jesus is buried in the church right next door to the Masjid Aqsa. So Umar radiallahu anhu goes there with him in his salat. So the patriarch says to Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, no, Mirul Mu'mineen, it's Salah time. Why don't you just pray here? Umar said, no. Look at it, foresight Umar. Umar said, no. He said, if I pray Salah here, subsequent generation will say, ah, Amirul Mu'mineen prayed Salah here. And then they will own this place. We own this place. This was amazing. You know how much impact that had on Salahuddin. When Salahuddin took Masjid al-Aqsa, he took Jerusalem, they said to Salahuddin, look, this war isn't going to finish. All you have to do is destroy this church because the Christians believe that Jesus is buried here. It's not even our Akidah. We believe he's gone to the heavens. Game over. No more battle. No more Christian. Salahuddin said, I can't do it. He said, why? Why can't you do it? He said, because a man better than me took Jerusalem and he didn't do it. Umar radiallahu anhu. That after Umar, he was the second person to conquer Masjid Al-Aqsa. And then Umar radiallahu anhu leaves. And Umar, before he leaves, he says to the Muslim, he said, look, Allah has fulfilled his promise to you. He said, now fulfill your promise to Allah. Be thankful and do not sin. Because once you sin, Allah will take his help away from you. These were the final words of Umar to the Muslims. Once you sin, Allah will take his help away from you. Look how much he gave to Islam. A man who would literally, literally spend his days working for the people in his Khilafah and literally spend the nights giving the rest of the nights for Allah Azza wa Jal. Things got so tough. No more water, no more crops. People were dying from hunger. It was a year of famine. The Muslims were going to be annihilated. 
At this time, every man for himself. But what were the Muslims worried about? They weren't worried about themselves. They were worried about Umar. Because they knew if they hadn't eaten, or if they hadn't eaten little, he's eaten even less. They knew if anyone would die from hunger first, it would Umar be Umar before them. He would walk around the streets, his face pale, his, his, his skin stuck to his bones in hunger. And he made that famous, famous statement to his stomach, whether you growl or you don't growl, you're not going to taste the meat until the children of Medina, of the Muslims, are eating meat. But I want to mention what he achieved in the 10 years that he ruled. He was the person who started the use of the Hijri calendar. He is the one who gathered the people in Taraweeh in Ramadan. He was the first person who created a proper army. And he was the first person who created the police department amongst the Muslims, where he had people who would walk around at night, and he did too himself, finding out what happened and maintaining law and order and seeing that everyone was okay. He was the first man who maintained the roads and built roads between cities and towns. He was the first man who developed what we know today as the Registrar General. You know, everything is recorded, the births, the deaths, and everything. Who is a civil servant? What do they get? And so on. Everything recorded. That was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an. He is the first man who decided that anyone who memorizes the Quran shall get an allowance from me, subhanallah. From Baytul Mal. He was the one who developed the treasury of the Muslims in such a beautiful way. He had so much that he used to spend even on the Christians and the non Muslims who were poor. He was the man who developed the system of taxing imported goods. When people brought goods from outside, he would tax it according to what he felt. He was a man who decided that the coins need to have specific weight and all the weights should be recorded. And when we are spending, we should have these gold and silver coins of specific weight and size. That was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He was a man who told his people never to destroy a place of worship that belongs to those who are non-Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this great man. Umar radiallahu anhu wakes up in the morning one day. He gets up and he starts waking up the Muslims for Salat al-Fajr. They all come to the mosque and he begins his prayer. While he's in his prayer, one of the slaves, the Jewish slaves, who, who made a specific double-edged knife, specifically for Umar radiallahu anhu, goes through the lines as the Muslims are praying and he stabs Umar several times. So much so, that Umar radiallahu when he dropped to the floor, he kept praying when he was stabbed. When he finally dropped to the floor, the Muslims got him milk to drink, when he would drink it in his mouth, it would come out of his stomach, come out of the holes in his body. And this is when they knew he would die. So Umar anhu, throughout his entire life, everything that he had done, now he's on the floor and he's dying. He goes unconscious, he wakes up. You know what he asks? He asks, have I prayed the Fajr prayer? They tell him, no, Ya Umar, and he faints. He wakes up again. Have I prayed the Fajr prayer? No, Ya Umar, and he faints. He wakes up again. Have I prayed the Fajr prayer? They go, No, Ya Umar, you dropped. His son brings a pillow to put under his head. He goes, Remove that pillow from under my head and put my head in the dirt. Maybe Allah will see my head in the dirt and have mercy on me. Because he missed one prayer. Because he missed one prayer. And it wasn't even his fault. He was in the actual prayer. Look at his status. He was already guaranteed paradise. Yeah, look how worried he was that he missed one prayer. In this condition, he says, bring me water so I can make wudu. And then he tells his son, stand me up. You want to stand up when you're in this position? Come on, man, listen to me. Stand me up. I don't want to pray when I'm lying down. And when they sat him up, and when they helped him get up, they, the narration says that, and he let out this cry of pain, and they laid him back down, and he prayed lying down. Now after Umar satisfied his, his soul and his Iman and, and completing Salat al-Fajr, then he asks the question that we would expect him to ask the first thing. He says, who killed me? So they tell him, the slave of Mughira. And he says, you mean the, the fire worshipper Abu Lu'lu? They say, yes, it was Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, he was a non-Muslim. You know what Umar says? He says, Alhamdulillah. 
that Allah has not made my death at the hands of a man who has even made one sajda to Allah by which by virtue of just making one prostration to Allah he can argue against me to Allah on the day of judgment subhanallah he then tells his son go to Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha tell her that Umar radiallahu anhu sends his salam to you and he says don't say the leader of the believers Amir al Mu'mineen because today I am no longer the leader of the believers send her salam and ask her permission that Umar is requesting he can be buried with his two companions the Prophet sallallahu and Abu Bakr when Abdullah went to Aisha he found her crying at the state of Umar, she was crying out of sadness for the state of Umar So he waited until finally he came and said salam and gave the message. Now when he came back, Aisha says to Abdullah she says that I was saving this place for myself. So I could be buried next to my husband, the Prophet of Allah, Muhammad Wasallam, and buried next to my father, Abu Bakr But today, I will give preference to Umar over myself عنه, I will allow him to be buried there Now when Abdullah comes back to Umar عنه, Umar says sit me up, sit me up He wanted to get the news in a state that he was ready He says there is nothing more important to me Good news oh my father Aisha has accepted your request Now look at Umar This is a gentleman brothers and sisters He says to his son After I die Take my body to her house To her room and don't enter and again send salam and say Umar is sending salam to you O Aisha and Umar again is requesting permission to be buried in this room you know why he said that? because he knew the emotions of Aisha and all the Sahaba were such that Aisha would maybe out of shyness to Umar and out of his condition this is a man brothers and you know what Aisha says? Yes, she gives him preference and he's buried there. And you know Umar, he died when he was 63 years old. You know how old Abu Bakr was when he died? 63 years old. You know how old the Prophet was when he died? 63 years old. It was as if Umar and Abu Bakr were created to, to live with the Prophet and die with the Prophet and they're buried next to the Prophet.